right, this is July 14th, Fog Hangout 3, and we have uh, senior developer Tom Elliott, senior developer Joe Schmidt, and myself, Wayne Workman. And we have one guest, but when I'm hovering over your picture, it doesn't tell me your name. Uh, are you talking about me? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay, because okay, I'm registered, I don't know. Um, yeah, so, uh, Scott Adams, um, I've, you know, I've posted a lot there on the forums, um, you know, mainly asking questions, but trying to offer some help, and um, I'm not sure why I'm showing up as guest, I don't know. It, well, I used a different link this time. Instead of the link in Google Calendar, I just did a... Uh, like a share link, I guess. I guess I won't do that anymore. Um, well, what's new, Scott? Well, we're it. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, so um, you know, we um, I've been in the uh, Jones County school system. We're we're in a out of Georgia. And I've been with the school system now about a year and a half, and honestly, this was my first uh, use of FOG. Uh, previously, I'd come from using, um, you know, stuff like uh, SCCM or Landesk, stuff like that to do my image in it, some other companies I'd worked out, but um, I really enjoyed using FOG. Um, you know, it's, uh, I want to say quirky, it can be a little quirky, I guess, sometimes. Um, depending on the hardware that we're using, um, you know, we all are always uh, really quick to respond and, and fix and update. I know Tom puts 12, 15 updates a day out there yeah, uh, for us to go to, um, and it's kind of hard to keep up all the hardware. I know we uh, we were doing a round of imaging today. Um, we had 30 uh, new laptops, uh, Dell Latitude 3350s. And um, we've seen this on a couple of models where we're having to uh, manually input a kernel argument for the uh, PCI equals no ACPI um, because you can you can boot the fog and when you go to do uh, a full inventory uh, was it full registration and inventory. Um, it will then go to a black screen, and then it will say no DHCP. And you've obviously got there because you're into fog, um, but you have to put in that kernel argument, and then it will get past that um, to where you can start putting in the name and everything of the computer. But even at that point, you then have to plug in a USB keyboard because the laptop keyboard no longer works. Um, you know, just just a, a little little nuance about that. Um, you know, we're having to recapture a lot of our images because um, we had an older new client on there. It was version nine point one six or whatever it was. Um, and then when we had upgraded to a, a newer version of the trunk, it upgraded to a fog client version ten point six, and it would not do the renames or um, domain joins if that client 9 was still on there. If that makes any sense. You're using client 10.6 uh, still? Yeah, we're still on 10.6. Now, we have not updated to the latest, you know, whatever in the 8,000s we're in now because um, we finally got it to a point that it's, that it's working for us. Um, and so we didn't want to, you know, attempt to go up again. Um, you, you know, know to, to the 11.3, 11. I think is is where we're fog version 11. Um, yep. And so, so yeah, we're, we're still, still using the uh, the 10.6. I think we're on SVN 77.17 or something like that. Um, but I mean, we had just got it to us to a pretty stable version, at least for for our concerns. Um, now I am not against update. There was once when me and Tom were going back and forth. I probably I probably updated, you know, five times in a row. I mean, back to back, you'd say, okay, I just made a fix, try it now, and I'd upgrade, and there'd be some other little thing with it. But, you know, he was very good at, at uh, 
you know, fixing my problems for me. But once we got to that 77-17, that's just kind of where we stayed at. Um, I'm not saying that this particular issue wouldn't be fixed in the newer version, but that's just kind of where we're at right now. It uh, it could be just a kernel issue, you know. Yeah. Since the laptops are so new, uh, you could probably update to the latest kernel. Just, yeah. Just the kernel. Uh, you could even uh download it under a different name than the usual name, and assign that kernel to just a host and and try it out. Yeah, yeah we, we we had done that previously. previously um. You know, we would, this was prior to um, even upgrading as far as we have, but we would have groups set up, and then we would assign um, different kernels to different groups because some older kernels work better with some other hardware, and the newer kernels wouldn't work right with them. And so there was a time when we had probably, you know, 10 different kernels out there, it seemed like. And depending on the type of hardware we'd get in, we'd have to assign a different kernel to it. But I mean, we've done that. Um, I can't remember the kernel version that we're on right now, but I think we're on one that was made back in May of this year. Um, I think there's maybe been two updated kernels since then, so I think. I don't think we're too far on, but I mean, I could definitely do that. So. Uh, wake, welcome to the, uh, the Hangout chat, uh, whoever you are. <laughs> Try to figure out. <clears throat> well, um, I, I tell you something that, that you know, it, it, it all comes down, down to time, and, and there's a lot of good documentation out there. It's just having the time to, to sit down and do it. But you know, currently we're doing, you know, her model images right and, you know, and, and that works you know that's um you know it, it, it fits our needs but you know kind of a bare metal you know universal image is definitely the way i would prefer to go um but just getting to that point is uh you know i can tell it's gonna take take some time and justifying that you know to the to the bosses can be a little uh you know they don't see the I guess the immediate benefit of that. So. Of a universal image? Well, they see the the benefit of that by the time it's going to take to get it all set up and working correctly. I think that it would take a lot less time than what, yep. you're, what you're thinking. Uh, Windows 10 has really great driver support right now because it's so new. Um, and there's a script, I think J.J. Fulmer posted on the forums that readies a, uh, an image to be a universal image. What it does is it uninstalls all uh, drivers for installed devices, I guess, and it uh, yeah. clears up a bunch of other temporary files. And uh, I think it even uh, defrags the hard drive, clears mm -hmm. the fog log, the, the last thing, I guess, and uh, and that's that's your universal image basically for Windows 10. You just you run that script, a shutdown, and upload. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And there's uh. But then, but then, but then wouldn't you, you as new hardware comes out? I mean, they're obviously, you know, going to have to put in new driver packs and stuff, and you would have to port that, you know, the new drivers into it somehow. I I would think that Windows Update might cover it. Except for specialty drivers like uh, like video card drivers, because those are hundreds mm -hmm. and hundreds of megs, they don't they don't put those specialty drivers in there. Um, but I've heard a lot of he's he said that he doesn't even worry about drivers anymore. JJ Fulmer, he said in that yeah. thread, because Windows 10 is that good with them. All right. I, I don't know why, but we can't post uh, text in this Hangout. I think it's how I, I uh, did the Hangout.
So, at work, we've been imaging anywhere from 50 to 100 and 110-ish computers uh, a day at 14 different locations with a really big fog system that we put together. Uh, with 14 storage nodes plus the main server it's a total of 14 um, and that's been going overall pretty good um, we have the location plugin set up and at, at any given time there could be three machines imaging at two or three different locations simultaneously and the uh, CPU usage on the main server is 0 0.14 or 0 0.2 it's it's basically sleeping on the job is uh, how little it's working because of the uh, storage nodes um, the other day we had six computers imaging at two different locations one image uploading and then another image that was earlier uploaded replicating uh, to 14 different servers and there was about 50 computers queued for being imaged and things started to bog a little bit but I think it was because of the replication and all of the random read write from the main server because its uh, hard drive speeds aren't the greatest because it's in a VM platform with like 20 other VMs um, but it's getting it done we've got 1200 or so 1300 maybe uh, computers registered at this point so rocking and rolling yeah what well, wasn't that the uh, I think I read that particular post you were wanting to change some sort of a value to dynamic yes or something right yeah yeah it's just I was my my mindset at that point was anything at all to lower the load but looking back now it really wasn't the problem at all the problem was the hard drive not being able to keep up and because the hard drive on the main server couldn't keep up my SQL got backlogged on uh, queries and so my SQL started I for lack of better term stuttering it started stuttering and we were getting the uh, update schema page just like intermittently and and it all comes back to the hard drive on the main server being too slow so what uh what speed hard drive are you using on your main server it's a uh, san uh, I don't I don't administer this particular uh, uh, VM platform um, but I know it that it's a san uh, redundant SAN. There's there's two different actual SANs that are mirrored, and two VM servers that are mirrored at all times. And then there's a switch between all of it. And the uh, the SANs have a, a redundant array of disks in each of them. So, but it's just I'm thinking that you know there's just copper between the sands and the main servers. I haven't seen it myself, but that's what I'm thinking. Hey, you tell them to upgrade the fiber. Yeah. And then with that, I think it could probably keep up. Yeah, because on your sand, I mean, I would hope that with, with a system like that, they're running, you know, 15K hard drives, because apart from SSD, I think that's about the fastest you're going to get on a yeah. physical disk. So. Even the, uh, like, a single image deployment from the main server it runs at six or so gigabytes per minute whereas you know my my virtual fog server in my building running in Hyper-V uh, with probably lower grade hardware performs above seven gigabytes per minute but the storage is on the same machine as the server so 
there's uh, six gigabit per second speeds there because it's uh, SAS two drives in in that server in my building. So yeah, we we use um you know ours is a simple setup. I mean we're talking one server that acts as the storage node and everything. And um I mean we're getting you know high sixes high six gigs to our uh, desktop. You know it it is pretty fast. Yeah. You know we can. And like I said, we're doing, you know, uh, specific images that even has some of the software even loaded on it. So, I mean, you're talking some pretty big images and, and we're, we're imaging machines in, uh, I mean, eight minutes. I mean, they're, they're going pretty quick. Yep. We have, uh, our, our images, because Windows 10 doesn't have any service packs yet that I'm aware of, it's pretty uh, fit. And lean as was like XP before service pack 2 as was Windows 7 before service pack 1 they all tens performing really good right now uh, our, our images are like 25 to 27 gigabytes for Windows 10 the Windows 7 images are actually a whole lot bigger so the Windows 10 images are deploying in about four minutes and that's just for image time. That's not booting and rebooting and domain joining. Yeah, that, that's something that we noticed uh, noticed today as well on these. And I don't think it's model specific or anything, but once once it gets these particular laptops, they got finished uh, imaging and they booted back up into Windows. Um, the fog user agent there was like this huge delay in it actually starting six um, seconds the, what's that i think the default uh for like the uh grace check-in time yep. is 60 seconds man i i think it was longer than that um i mean i wasn't sitting there timing it but um we would have to rush it by actually starting the fog user service ourselves. Wow. Now the fog the fog service in the services was actually running, but the user service or the agent was not kicking on. Um, so we would turn that on and then you would wait. I'd say that was probably about sixty seconds or so. And then it would go, okay, well your computer's named differently. So it, it did its reboot task like it was supposed to. Came back on um log back into the computer and the fog user agent was on but this time the fog service hadn't started yet so it was set to automatic but you we actually had to start the service so i don't know what was going on there but that happened on multiple machines today i'd say out of the 30 that we imaged that happened on 10 of them you are about seven versions behind yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's no telling if if that's fixed or not. Um, and and I think, quite honestly, um, the reason we have not upgraded again was, I think I remember reading a thread uh, that when you upgraded to version ten, that it would not auto update the client if it was nine or earlier. Yeah, that I was, think that was uh, broke for a minute. Yeah, so I, I think that's been our hesitation in upgrading because we would have to go and you're on ten six right now though, right? We're on ten six now. Yeah. So you're I mean, past ten upgrade just fine. Yeah. So the okay. You're past the danger zone. Okay. See, once we kind of get somewhere where it's working, we're like, we're just gonna leave it alone. We're gonna work. Yeah. <laughs> and that's but all right. Yeah. I mean, if it'll auto upgrade the uh, the agent, then then uh, yeah, I'd be more than willing to to, you know, update the latest trunk. You know what you uh, can do? I've been meaning to write something up about this. Is like, what's the best, what's the safest way to update a, a fog trunk system to a newer version? Uh, uh, what I've been doing is, firstly, I take a database backup, okay? 
and I use the web interface to do that. Um, I make sure in the dot fog settings file that I have a, a web interface username and password defined that way the installer backs up the database for me so there's two database backups that happen one before update that I do and one during update that the installer does but before all that so I, I take my database backup from the web interface and then I go into uh, client settings in the fog settings area and I uncheck the automatic updating for the uh, the client if and only if there's been a client release uh, since I last updated and what that does is um, if things go terribly wrong during the update for whatever reason and it has happened uh, machines out in the field they won't update their client they'll keep the version they have and then I can roll back the database roll back the uh, the web files and then everything's back to the way it was before um, because if you leave that automatic client update checked and you get so far into the installer and something fails or something doesn't work right even if the installation completes if something just doesn't work well now you have all of your uh, your hosts in the field updating their client and if you roll back then everything's gonna break and the client won't probably may not be able to communicate with the uh, the web server so that's what I've been doing I take my database backups and then I disable the fog client automatic updating and then I update make sure everything's good and then I allow the clients to update kind of like a multi-step update but it's a little safer in my opinion you said you also backed up the uh the web files too i guess you're doing that manually because that's not the installer uh, does that for you if uh you look in uh forward slash home they're all in there there it'll be a bunch of folders in there and mm -hmm. the, all of those will be the uh the web directories backups they'll all be numbered with the version they were uh updated to I believe and uh, then there will be a folder with all of the database backups in it if you have those new fields in the dot fog settings file filled out mm -hmm. yeah I also try to take snapshots too because because the more ways that you can go back the better yeah, if we were virtualizing Pog, that would definitely happen, but it's on a physical server. Unfortunately, no snapshot on that. Yeah. <laughs> Even then, uh, with with how the installer makes a copy of the web files and can make a copy of the database for you, I mean, unless like a, a, like a major Linux package just totally fails you can go back and when I say like a Linux package so the f fog installer it updates all the packages that it uses um, and those may have dependencies and uh, it's all dynamic so the updates are dynamic they use the uh, the local systems uh, repo manager, uh, either yum or DNF or apt or whatever. It updates all that stuff, and if if that stuff fails, then you gotta fix that manually, and backups won't help you there. And, but a snapshot will. I've not imaged anything at home in quite a while. I'm just realizing. The laptop I'm using right now, it's not registered at home.
Joe, anything new with snap impacts? You were talking about changing things up. Uh, Tom and I are working on changing up the interface to simplify things, uh, remove that config JSON file, make things a little bit easier to use for users. I think that'll be better. Um, not that I disliked the config.json file, but um, someone who has never done that before, I think that could uh, scare them from using snap impacts. Um, I think it'll be good to uh, simplify things. Only the developers are left in, in, in Wayne. Well, I guess, uh, I guess that we can uh, call it a good hangout. It was the shortest one, but pretty good one, I guess. All right. Oh, Scott's back. Yeah, sorry, I'm having to use my uh, phone now. We just lost internet out here. Hmm. We were just talking about snap impacts. And snap impacts are something that you're only able to use with client 11.3. Uh, now, what, what's, what's the, the difference, difference in a snap in pack and a snap in? A snap in is a way to deploy a single executable. A snap in pack, you can bundle together as many files as you want, along with at least one executable, and then you would uh, direct fog to uh, run that executable with arguments if you need them and the executable can be a script PowerShell script an exe, a MSI a bash, bash file um, just any any sort of executable and that will allow you to roll out things like Microsoft Office Adobe Creative Cloud AutoCAD or, or smaller things or just files you know it could just be a bunch of files and a batch script to just copy things where you want them to go. Yeah, because I've played, played around with snap-ins, snap and I've got a few, and, and they work well, but yeah, the, the packs. The, so that's something new that started with, uh, what, I don't want to say 11.3, the latest trunk, I guess. 11.3, or yeah. 11.3, okay. They're going to be made uh, easier to use as well. There was an announcement about it, <clears throat> and it talked about using uh, a JSON file for configuration. And uh, I think Joe's going to do away with that. And uh, Joe and Tom are working together to make snap ins, snap in packs, easier to work with. So, not that they were difficult before. It's just like a six line text file, the, the JSON file was. So, but it, I mean, it could confuse some people who don't have a lot of scripting experience. So, it'd be good to simplify it. You having any other problems or things going on, Scott? Uh, that's, that's really our big, big one right now. now. Um, I, know I know we, we were, were having, having some issues with the, the uh, Microsoft, Microsoft surfaces. surfaces. Um, but I want to say one of the postings that I did on that, Tom was able to help me out as well. 
Um, but it, it's kind of almost the, uh, the same thing. You have to add the parameters for, uh, you know, USB NICs. Yep. Um, and I'm trying to think what our one particular issue was. We, we put that kernel parameter in there. Um, oh, oh yeah. And it was the, uh, the actual surface keyboard, the surface keyboard works fine when you're in the, like the, uh, you know, when you can choose, uh, you know, like host deletion or the, the main fog menu whenever you uh, pixie boot it, uh -huh. uh, the, the, the Surface keyboard worked great. But whenever you would um, get past that to where you had to, you know, unplug the USB, plug it back in, hit enter, that keyboard wasn't working anymore. So we have to do like this quick ninja plug in a plug in a USB keyboard, hit enter, take it out, plug in the USB NIC, and then it works fine. <laughs> it continues on the Pixie, and that's kind of where we're at there. Um, again, something we can work around, um, but I, I don't, that would almost sound like kernel to me if it wasn't working in the, the fog menu, but the Surface keyboard worked just fine in fog menu. Have you tried? So I'm not sure. Have you tried using a USB hub? Uh, I did try that um, to try and avoid the the ninja skills, and it wasn't registering it at all. You know, the the surf, at least in my experience, the surfaces are real picky about you know what you're plugging into them. At least right there at the beginning, um, before it loads into Windows. Now, once you get in Windows, you can do a USB hub and installs it works just fine. But we even had to purchase the specific Microsoft Surface adapters because the Belkin one that we had, it, Surface wouldn't see it at all, would not see it at boot up. Now, once you boot it into Windows, it would see it, but in the UEFI, it didn't see it at all. It's like they just come preloaded. Now, I know you could get into, you know, adding, probably adding drivers into the Surface UEFI or something, but I think... That's, That's a little bit beyond, beyond me, man. man. <laughs> it would be in the uh, boot ROM. It would be the uh, ipixie.efi file, I mm -hmm. is what would need to be modified. But, but, but that's, that's what we saw. saw. Um, so, so that, I mean, those two issues are, are big ones right now, and, and even then it's not big because we, we, we got to work around for it. it. Um, but, but maybe, maybe upgrading to the latest. latest. I, I know. I know that's you know typical, typical software talk. You know, well, hey, update the latest version. version. Um, but, but I know it helps, helps with a lot of stuff. You um, could update the uh, the boot files only. You don't have to update the entire server, and you could try the newer the newer boot files, and maybe yeah, yeah. maybe they'll work. Yeah, if, if I'll, I'll give that a shot. Then restore your old ones. Mm -hmm. So, and you can just you can download those from uh, GitHub, or uh, if SourceForge is back online, SourceForge. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, Fog's Fog's been running real smooth for us, man. Real smooth. It uh, it got me into Linux. I tell you that I wasn't a Linux guy until I started using Fog. Same here. Same here. It was a year and a half ago for me, and I was so lost. I was so helpless. It took me two weeks to figure out through Googling, and I had no idea what I was doing, Googling uh, to figure out an FTP problem in Fedora 21, which I was installing Fog on, and Fog didn't support Fedora 21 at the time, not officially, and... Uh, I managed to find the answer and then when I was telling Tom about the problem on the forums he just like spit out the answer like like he knew already so yeah, yeah well, one, one, one issue he was fixing for us I was trying to keep up with him I was watching him while he was in my system and I just gave up after 10 seconds because I, I just couldn't read that fast <laughs> Yeah. Well, he kn he knows where everything is. 
That's right. <laughs> he, he says, says sorry. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's yeah, we, we've been, been real pleased, pleased with the system. system. I would like to... Uh, to, to get, get more, more like try the universal imaging. imaging. Now, now we're, we're not, not uh, we're still mainly Windows 7. I think, you know, percentage wise, probably 3% of our, uh, you know, infrastructure is using Windows 10 at the moment. Uh, we're still working on group policies to, you know, take care of some of that stuff. Um, but, but if I can get Windows 10 universal imaging going, and if it's as easy as you say it is, then maybe they'll, you know, I can make the case to put a little bit more time into Windows 7 as well, and, um, you know, yeah, since, since they'll be able to see the benefit of that, so. Yeah, well, the benefit is having a one image for many models that you have that you update once, and that's, uh, you know, it's one, one image is worth of space on the server instead of 20 or 30, in our case, uh, yeah, because yeah, I, I think now, now we're using, using we're probably, probably using 600 something gig, gig just in images. images. That's a lot. That's, that's a lot. That's a lot. lot. Well, we, we got, got a lot of models of, of computers, computers and uh, like, like you've, you've got, got one particular model, model that, um, you yeah, know, we've, we've got, got three different, different images of because one of them is a, a smart board type image and then another one has like the full Adobe Creative Suite on it. Um, like, like I said, we, have, we some, some of our images, images we have specialized software on them, so you're just you know tripling, quadrupling the you know the space that you're using because you've got four different versions of the same image, basically. So yeah, yeah, I think we've got like twenty-seven, I think twenty-seven different models of computers. We probably have about that many. But we don't have images for most of our models yet. Just the newer models. Hopefully we'll be completely Dell someday. That's my goal. Yeah, luckily we are. We're a complete Dell shop. Consider yourself lucky. Lenovo's yeah. are, are mean sometimes when it yeah. comes to uh, a lot of stuff. Their bi well, BIOS interface uh, is rough. Yeah. It's old school. It doesn't have a mouse. Or, well, the, the ones that I have are, anyways. Yeah. Well, well I, I should say, say that, that, you know, we, we do, do have those, those, you know, I think we've got 40, 40 Microsoft surfaces. So, apart, apart from those, those we're, we're, we're a Dell shop. shop. Um, another, another thread that, that I'd read, read that we're, because, because we're, we're talking about the surfaces, surfaces now. now the difference in UEFI and BIOS and uh, getting those to cohabitate um, where or we I'm currently uh, trying to set up a 2016 uh, DHCP server so that I can not have to go in and manually make changes to scopes to point to different files um, I tried following the tutorial that they that said it it may or may not work uh, for, for the, the 2008 DHCP, DHCP it ain't working. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like 2016 is going to be the way we need to go, go and that's, that's what, what I'm working, working on. So. Yep. And when you say it's 2016, you mean 2012 R2? 2012 R2, R2 sorry. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're running now. Uh, yeah. The, uh, the tutorial for server 2012, it works. If you follow it step by step, it's every step's included. It works completely. I know because not only have I, I done it like uh, 15 times now, and maybe maybe an, an additional five on other people's servers through TeamViewer. I was the guy that wrote like most of that that article so I know it pretty well all right, all right then, then, then it'll, it'll work, work. I, have, I have the, the utmost, utmost confidence. confidence but fog DHCP <laughs> out of the box will work as well so, so just, just set, set that, that as, as a, a uh, 
you know, because I think right now we're running three different DHCP servers. So just make that as one of the DHCPs that your clients are hitting. All of them. Okay. Yeah. If you if you skip, like I don't know how your how your DHCP servers are set up, but if you've got split scope going on, which is like two DHCP servers on one broadcast domain, well, all, all those servers have to have the same settings, and then the the ranges have to be split so that they don't overlap. Okay. Yeah. Uh, but if they're not on the same broadcast domain, then I guess just do it where you need to. Yeah. Cool. Well. Those steps, they'll also work. I wrote them for 2012 server, but they work for R2 as well. I've done both, so, and the steps are identical. Any, uh, any future plans? I don't know how it would work, but, uh, on having, uh, Fog be able to, um, to image wireless? Easier said than done. <laughs> Yeah, that in wireless doesn't have much throughput if you uh, congest it with a bunch of uh, bunch of devices trying to all use the same uh, medium. It's a shared medium, right? So, and they have to wait for turns to speak, right? Because well, it depends on how many channels your access point has, and say it's a one-channel access point, like old school, then. Let's see what Tom's saying. The problem with wireless and making installer do this is normally you need the SSID and pass as part of the IPXC files, then you need the same info again with the inits. But if you are in control, if you've got enterprise wireless and you're in control of that, you can set up an SSID where all clients on the uh, that SSID can only communicate with the fog server. And then you could just open it up. No password. But then you would still need to know the the, uh, the network name and I guess you would you could pass that as a kernel argument, I suppose. I just wonder how that would work too. Like, um, I know we're not the only ones, but uh, who use uh, 802.1x, so you're using certificate-based wireless authentication. So you're not using a password; you're using a cert passed out by a server. Yeah. Um, that might make it a little trickier in in those particular uh, installations. So. Well, if you could include the certificate. In the uh, in the init, that might work. Maybe. Maybe that that probably goes back to the easier said than done because each each device gets its own cert, a different cert from the uh, yeah, a different cert is created and and linked up to your CA. I think maybe certificates aren't a good idea for imaging over wireless. <laughs> Probably not. But you could So maybe for us, but other, you know, other groups, you know, it may benefit somebody. I don't know. If it can be done. Yeah, I was going to say, or there may not be enough call or need or reason to do it, but just a, just a curiosity question. It would make a lot of sense for tablets because why well, I, I know that WDS can uh, image surfaces over wireless. Um, they're designed to be a wireless device and I think it would e be easier to image those over wireless 
just as it'd be easier to image a desktop over a wire. Um, it's a uh, sounds like a lot of work, but I think that if you're using a username and a password and an SSID, or just a SSID and a password, I guess those could just be kernel arguments or you could build them into your init if you don't want to pass them as plain text over the network there's also uh, there's also FOSS uh, on USB like a flash drive have you messed with that at all I have not. I've I've seen that term thrown around a bit in the forums, but uh, no, we have, we have not messed with that. I, I'm assuming it's close to. Um, I have at one point used something called Clonezilla, and um, I was doing that straight with a a CD and a hard drive, and I would do that per machine, uh, kind of like old school ghosting, you know. Um, but I'm assuming it's about the same thing. Not quite. Uh, not quite. Uh, so, FOSS on, on USB is like the FOG operating system. It's literally the same thing that runs if you were to just boot a network, boot a computer on the network. Uh, you get a little menu. It, it uh, has kernels and inits uh, already. I think it skips the I, IPIXI process completely now. George George 1421 put this all together. He's been doing all the work on it. Um, and it's for computers that have problems with iPixie. Um, you still need a network connection to image though. So FOSS loads from USB and then it pulls the image from the fog server as normal after that point. There's a bunch of threads about it. Mm -hmm. George recommends it a lot. Tom is typing. <laughs> it brings in the environment dynamically. So you can even initiate a task from debug within the USB. I, I understand uh, that the FOSS USB bootable media can do uploading, or well, capturing and deploying both in normal modes and in debug. And it cannot do any of the other things that you can normally do. But Tom says everything, it can do everything. Yeah, he says it's everything. <laughs> okay. I've not personally used it. Well, we, we haven't run into anything that can't iPixie yet, so hopefully we won't. <laughs> but that's cool. That's an option out there. So. Tom says it's 
says it's useful with uh, with Max as well. Who don't know about blessing? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the bless is, but I've only heard about it. I'm not really a Mac person. Yeah, we we have we have zero Macs in my environment. Yeah, we have a lot, a lot of Macs. We're getting rid of them because they're too expensive, and Apple is getting away from supporting them with uh, the server version of OS X. Well, would everyone be okay with saying this was a good fog hangout? Yeah. Bubba's here. Hi, Bubba. Oh, and he's gone. gone. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> he can figure it out and, uh, and join the next one. All right. Tom says he's tired. All right. We'll call it quits. It was a good hangout. All, All right. right. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. You're welcome. See you on the next one. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. See you.